Good evening, I'm Michael Riff, Director of the Gross Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Ramapo College. And on behalf of our uh, collaborators, uh, our co-sponsors, uh, 3GNY, the Institute of Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Raritan Community College, and the New Jersey State Commission on Holocaust Education. It is my profound pleasure to welcome everybody. This evening, we are joining up with 3GNY and their uh, We Do, uh, We Educate initiative to present a preview of a workshop that we will be holding on May 17th under the title, A Living Legacy, Bringing Third Generation Stories of Survival into the Classroom. Given the dwindling number of survivors available to convey their experiences to students themselves, our aim is for their grandchildren to assume this solemn responsibility. We hope thereby not only to insist the imparting the history of the Holocaust in a personable, personal, approachable, and factually accurate manner, but also to actively engage students in thinking about ways to confront the intolerance and prejudice they may encounter in their lives today. To further illuminate these burning issues, we envisage students being motivated to explore the connections to the experiences of their own families. For a start, I'd like to introduce this evening's speakers. Unfortunately, one of them will not be joining us this evening because he had a prior uh, commitment, and that's Doug Servi, the Executive uh, Director of the New Jersey Commission uh, on Holocaust Education. The uh, commission, uh, as uh, some of you know, uh, is uh, really the umbrella organization in the state uh, for uh, institutions uh, such as ours. And it helps uh, teachers in a very practical way uh, to impart uh, the history and lessons of the Holocaust. And I uh, will, in a, in a few moments, I'll uh, post, I'll try to post uh, their uh, web address uh, so that uh, those of you who are not in contact uh, with them uh, can avail yourselves of their, uh, manif uh, their manifold uh, resources. Our first uh, speaker uh, will be Dave Reckes, who is the executive director of 3GNY, Descendants of Holocaust. <clears throat> the, uh, the descendant of uh, Holocaust survivors, he will tell us about his organization and what it can offer educate, uh, educators. Uh, actually, uh, Dave is uh, the grandson of uh, Holocaust survivors from Poland and Russia, and he shares his uh, Bubi Sarah's story through th the uh, 3GNY's uh, We Do uh, program. Trained as an elementary school teacher, Dave has extensive, uh, an extensive background in education, management, and nonprofit leadership. Raised in Poughkeepsie, New York, he now lives with his wife and two children on a small farm outside of Syracuse. Following Dave uh, it is, is my kinsman, Daniel Riff, who is the grandson of four Holocaust survivors. Last fall, he joined 3GNY's uh, We Do uh, program to put the full narrative of his grandfather's life together to share with students, a preview of which you will see and hear shortly. Daniel also recently created a presentation based on his maternal grandmother's story of survival. Daniel grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, and currently lives in Brooklyn. 
He graduated from Washington University in St. Louis and is a senior manager at DoorDash, leading strategy and operations for government and nonprofit agencies delivering food and other essential items to households in need. Our last presenter is Heather Lutz, an education educator at Pascack Hills High School in Montvale, New Jersey, where she teaches four sections of literature of the Holocaust, a dual enrollment course of her own design. Uh, she is a teaching fellow at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum and an Alfred Lerner fellow uh, through the Jewish Foundation for the Righteous. And she has presented at numerous national and local uh, conferences on the Holocaust and its memory. Herself, the grandchild of Holocaust survivors, Heather is currently writing her dissertation on the material culture of the Holocaust uh, rem and rem remembrance with a keen focus on legacy, identity, and artifactual literacy. Uh, finally, I would just, before handing uh, over the floor to uh, Dave Reckes, I would uh, like you to know that there will be a Q&A &A after the end of the formal part of the program. So kindly submit your questions through the Zoom's Q&A function, which you will find on the bottom of your screen. Uh, afterwards, I will relay the questions uh, to the speakers. So Dave, I guess uh, you can uh, continue and uh, I'm sure everybody will find this uh, program uh, extremely worthwhile. Well, thank you so much, Michael. It's really an honor to be here. Um, we appreciate your work at the, the Gross Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies um, and having an opportunity to be a part of this program with you and along with Daniel and Heather. Um, and for all of you out there who are watching, we really appreciate you taking time out of your evening to join us and to learn a little bit more and think about how we can use 3G stories in the classroom in an effective way. And so um, I have just a, a couple of quick slides that I would like to share with you um, just by way of introduction in case you are not familiar with 3G NY. Um, my name is Dave Reckes. I'm the executive director of 3G NY. And uh, we are an organization that was founded by 3Gs. And if you're not familiar with that terminology, 3G stands for the third generation. It's how we refer to grandchildren of Holocaust survivors. Um, and we are an educational organization that's dedicated to using our grandparents' stories and our family experiences as a way to educate diverse audiences about the dangers of intolerance and the importance of acceptance of understanding of building connections with others. We also are um, really committed to creating a network of support for 3Gs. And as you'll see this evening, there are three of us on this, uh, on this panel um, who have very different life experiences, very different family histories, and yet are brought together by that, that bond of knowing that our grandparents, um, in some cases one, in some cases many, went through the unthinkable and the awful experiences that they did, and that that has informed who we are as people, who we are as professionals, and how we relate to other people and our responsibility to keep their stories going. And so you'll hear tonight about our We Do program, which is our flagship educational program. Um, it stands for We Educate. And um, you'll get to hear a little bit, uh, a, a sample of a We Do story from Daniel. And then I'm really looking forward to uh, Heather's comments as a, not only a 3G who shares her family story, but also a teacher who has some really great insight about how to help students think about and connect with the important lessons of the Holocaust. As Michael mentioned, um, I am a 3G. I, all four of my grandparents survived the Holocaust in different places. Um, when I go into to classrooms to share my story, it's my Booby Sarah story that I tell. And so I wanted to bring her into this conversation with all of you because one of the great honors of my job is that I literally get to bring her with me every day that I go to work and every day when I go into a classroom to share. Um, so that's her in the middle of, and 
uh, buffered by myself and my brother. Um, and then the picture in the top left is a picture that I share with students because it is, as far as I know, the earliest picture that we have of her. Um, it was taken probably in the late 1940s when she made it to New York. Um, and I talk with students about what that means that we don't have any childhood pictures and we don't have family albums and things like that. And we talk about why and we talk about what that means for our family, our legacy, our understanding of memory. Blibi Sarah was born in uh, or just outside of Lublin, Poland and survived the war in the Lublin ghetto. Um, she had a, a sort of crazy escape from the Maidanic concentration camp and then spent the bulk of the war um, over three and a half years in hiding in a small apartment in Warsaw. Uh, so I just wanted to bring Bubi with you or with, with me to this evening and let you know that um, she's always with me in the work that I do with students and with, uh, with other 3Gs and other teachers as well. So in case you're wondering a little bit more about this We Do program that, we, um, that we've talked about, we have, uh, we've been running this program since 2010 and really with that understanding of as the survivor generation is getting older and as there are fewer and fewer survivors who are um, around and willing and able to go and share their stories, many 3Gs in our generation have recognized that now it's on us, that it's our responsibility and our, our duty and our mission to make sure that their stories are carried forward to new generations and that we can glean some sort of lessons for how we can live our lives today, knowing what our family and our grandparents' story has informed in us. And so over the course of the last 11 years, we have trained over 300, it's actually now over 350 volunteers um, to compellingly share their story. And going through our training program, grandchildren learn how to pull certain details from their story, do research where it's needed to fill in gaps, um, and construct a narrative that's going to connect on a personal and an empathetic level with students. And that's really the goal of our program is not necessarily to teach everything there is to know about the Holocaust, but to build that personal bridge so that every student feels that they know somebody who has been directly affected by the Holocaust and who is still living today with the memory and the legacy and the lessons of what that teaches. And so over that time, we have um, presented to over 30,000 students and community members, uh, largely in the New York City area, but increasingly further and further afield. Um, many of them have been in-person presentations over the last year and a half. Um, we've had a lot of success with virtual presentations as well, such as this one, and using virtual platforms to go into classrooms and have, still have an engaging conversation with students. We, what we know, because studies have shown that students who receive Holocaust education are more tolerant and more comfortable with people from other backgrounds. And we know that if that Holocaust education is paired with testimony from survivors, that it makes it helps students be even more likely to challenge incorrect or hurtful behavior and to be upstanders when they see injustice. So with that, with that data, that drives the work that we do because we know that we have the power to impact a whole new generation of students and help them be more tolerant, more accepting, and willing to stand up to, to counter hurtful or um, discriminatory behavior. One of, the, one of my favorite things in, in my role as executive director is doing outreach to schools and sharing with them about our WeDo program um, and people are generally, teachers in particular, are generally happy to hear about the program and what we offer. And then I get to tell them that it's free and that our speakers are always free to schools and community groups to go in to share their stories because our mission is really to share our stories with as many students as we can. And so uh, those presentations are, are always free. They're supported by the generosity of our, our community. Um, some of you may already be generous sponsors of, of the work that we do, um, but it really is the donations that um, our community provides that help us and allow us to continue to reach more and more students every year. Uh, and so just really quickly, in addition to the education program that we run um, through WeDo, 
3GNY also provides, as I mentioned earlier, that network for 3Gs to connect. And so we work to educate others. We also work to educate ourselves. We hold webinars such as this one, um, lectures, discussion groups, opportunities for 3Gs to connect with other 3Gs and talk about what, what that experience was like of being the grandchild of survivors and maybe how that has informed our view of modern politics, anti-Semitism in the world, um, just our place in our family, how we relate to other people, and really being there for each other to make sure that we can support each other. And we also have a very keen eye towards what is happening in the world today and knowing that we have the responsibility to use our legacy and our place in society to try to impact change, to try to make things better for everyone, a more equitable and a more just world. If you are interested in learning more about some of those programs or getting involved in taking the We Do class yourself, um, or just learning alongside us, because you do not have to be a 3G to take part in our programs, um, feel, feel free to visit our website and you can sign up for our newsletter um, and we'll make sure that you know of all of the, th the great events coming up. So the last thing uh, before I get to introduce Daniel, which I'm really thrilled for, um, is just to let you know how as teachers or as school professionals, um, how to invite a speaker into your classroom. And uh, again, it's free, uh, which is my favorite. There's an email address on the screen right there um, for uh, Jesse, who is our scheduler, and he will give you all of the information that you need to book someone to come to your class. Um, or you can visit our website and there's a we do tab and a form if you just click request a speaker um, and we would love to hear from you and find a time either to send someone in person if that's feasible um, with distance and with COVID and all of that or to set up a virtual presentation for your students. Um, we're more than happy to do that. So with that, uh, I have the distinct pleasure of passing the, the baton over to Daniel Riff. And as Michael mentioned earlier, Daniel joined our We Do training last year and um, has been featured in one of our We Do Wednesday um, community programs to share his story with a wider audience. And um, really, is I love hearing Daniel's story and you'll get to hear a, a piece of it because it's a, such a great example of how telling a grandparent's story can be that direct line of empathy, of kind of feeling from your heart what Daniel's experience was like growing up with that family legacy. So with no further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Daniel and uh, take it away. Thanks, Dave. Um, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Daniel Riff, and uh, I'm honored to be able to, to talk to you tonight. Um, I live in Brooklyn, and I am the grandson of four Holocaust survivors. And as Dave mentioned, I did the We Do program last fall, focusing on my paternal grandfather's story, uh, my Zeta Morris. Um, my Zeta Morris, uh, uh, you know, I, I did get to know him when I was younger. Um, he passed away when I was in high school um, and I didn't get to hear his story directly from him, but I, I knew um, growing up that, he was a Holocaust survivor and I had the fortune of um, being able to hear about his story directly from him through an audio interview that my dad did with him and also a, a video testimony that he did um, in the 80s as well. So I feel pretty fortunate that um, I could hear his story uh, directly from him, even if, even if not in person. Um, and I also had the chance to uh, retrace um, some of his uh, steps when I, when I visited his hometown in college in college as well. Um, his story um, is is pretty special. He was uh, from the town in Germany, uh, the town in Poland that is known um, by the world um, by its German name, which is Auschwitz. Um, but in Polish was Oświęcim, or uh, in Yiddish was Oświęcim. Um, he and his, uh, he was never a prisoner of that camp, um, but he and his father uh, were, were sign painters um, at the camp as it was being created um, when they still lived in the town nearby. Uh, and his, his father actually painted the, the first sign that said uh, concentration lager Auschwitz, meaning Auschwitz concentration camp. So um, they, they were among the first uh, 
out, outside of um, Nazi leaders who, who knew what that site would become. Uh, and what, in terms of the reasons that I participated in We Do and why I appreciate having the chance to tell his story, um, I, I want to do anything that I can to personalize learning about the Holocaust. Uh, for me, it was something even as grandson of survivors learned about in school year after year, or learned about in Hebrew school year after year. Uh, and it was, there were moments for me that were more personal, um, including uh, engaging directly with my, my grandparents' testimonies uh, and also being able to, to go um, to, uh, you know, Eastern Europe and see some of these sites for myself. But um, especially for kids that are in schools um, that don't have direct connection and are not, um, you know, tra traveling the world at that time, I want to make it personal and I want them to have a connection to what happened. Um, and I, I'm happy to, to be that bridge in any way that I can. Um, and I also know that um, for both him and for uh, my, my grandmother that uh, they would be, you know, they shared their testimonies, they, they wanted to be heard, they, they didn't want their stories to be forgotten. So um, I'm glad to be able to, to carry that on. And uh, I, the, the um, last thing that I want to mention before I, I go into part of the, the story uh, is that one thing I, I didn't really expect going into this um, but has been true with both of the testimonies that um, both of the presentations that I've prepared is uh, the experience of telling a story together with one of my grandparents um, has been pretty powerful. Uh, so you'll see there's there's some video in the presentation um, and I like that we get a chance to, to tell together. So uh, I'm going to go into a piece of the presentation. Uh, this part is when I'm describing his experience near the end of the war, right before he was liberated. Um, there's one point where I do ask the audience uh, a question, so I'll, I'll just pause uh, during this presentation, but when I am speaking in front of uh, groups, classes, etc., cetera, um, that I, I do like to have some engagement during the presentation. Um, so with that, I will share my screen. All right. By March 1945, he could hear artillery fire as the American army was getting closer. And he knew the war would be over soon. The Nazis retreated, marching the Jews with them. For two days, my grandfather walked on what was called a death march, where he received two pounds of bread for two days and if he got weak, he'd be shot. He described passing the beautiful scenery, mountains and rivers in springtime, but passing lifeless bodies in ditches as well. And things were about to get much worse. The next morning, he wakes up and he and a thousand other prisoners are forced to board a train of cattle cars with little food. You can see here what these cattle cars looked like. There are 50 people in his car. He doesn't know where he's going or how long it will take, but he knows that the Nazis are losing the war badly, so they won't need him alive as a worker for much longer. In that cattle car, he can't stand because the two Nazi guards fear an uprising if they allow the Jews to stand. He can't lie down because there are too many people. He can't go to the bathroom. Or he can, but he just has to go in that car filled with people. He's passing through the countryside, but he's also passing through large cities. It's freezing cold, and since the cattle car has no roof, he's covered in snow. But my grandfather says he's fortunate to be covered in snow. Can you guess why? He runs out of food after two days and has no water, but he can lick the snow. 
He licks the snow and that helps him stay alive. One morning in that cattle car, he wakes up and realizes that some of the others suffering around him are dead. Maybe they died of hunger or of thirst or of cold. It's impossible to know. And the bodies of the dead remain in the cattle car with the increasingly weak bodies of the living. So those surviving make the most of the situation. He said, we gathered the dead at the end of the car. Some people slept on them, using them as head pillows to put their head down. Some people sat on them. It didn't matter anymore. We were all so used to that and it didn't bother us at all. He thinks he'll die too not from the hunger or the thirst or even the cold, but from the cramps he feels sitting down. He sits in that cattle car for a day, two days, three days, four days, five days, and he survives. Reaching the next camp, Buchenwald, the eighth camp he's been in, 250 of his fellow passengers, a quarter of the Jews who had boarded that train after surviving for years of Nazi terror, died during those five days. Arriving at Buchenwald, Nazis immediately cut all of his hair and took him to the bathhouse, where at least he could drink the bath water. Again, things were even worse than before. We were given new fresh clothes and were sent to the barracks. And the barracks, these were wooden barracks, were there were three, like, like tiers. tiers. And every tier was divided for five, for five people. So we were laying one next to the other. Just wood, no blankets. We were laying our clothes. Most of the people that came with that transport had frozen parts of their body. I had my toes frozen. Some had worse of freezings. There we got once a day a bowl of, of, of soup, cabbage soup, and a piece of bread. People, most of the people ate it in one shot, and then they were going around hungry and wild, and they ate grass, and they ate whatever they could pick up to survive. I personally was always able to control my hunger, and I divided and I split it, but I had to watch that piece of bread, keep it on my body, under my shirt, because otherwise it was stolen from me by other prisoners. People were dying by the hundreds around him, and death seemed certain. Here you can see pictures of prisoners at Buchenwald during this time. Well, I don't think he's in these pictures. It would be tough to recognize him. This is probably what he looked like at age 23. He was then taken to two more camps over the next few weeks, hearing sirens indicating that the allies were bombing the area. He knew he was so close to the end of the war, but he was sleeping in a tent five bunks high and with the little that was left of his body being eaten by lice. The Germans continued trying to kill the prisoners through exhaustion, marching him back toward Buchenwald. While they were stopped at night, he heard another siren and the Germans ordered them all to lie down in a field. They began shooting. My grandfather was shot in the shoulder, but he was so weak that he said it felt like a tickle. 
and then he felt warm blood covering his body and he fell asleep. The friends he was with carried him the rest of the way to Buchenwald the next morning and he went to the barrack for the sick. Every day, the guards searched the barracks and sent any Jews somewhere else. So he and a few friends would move some ceiling boards and hide in the attic. One day when he was hiding, he suddenly heard screaming and people crying. He and his friends came down from the attic and found out that Americans were surrounding the camp. It was April 11th, 1945, and he was liberated and cried more than he had in his life. But that was not the end of his struggle. So that's part of the presentation that I wanted to share with you all tonight. Uh, and when we have the, the um, full session with um, you know, the, this group uh, in the spring, I'm happy to share the, the entirety of the story. Uh, a few things that I wanted to share just about my experience sharing this presentation with groups. So I, uh, again, did this, the We Do program about a year ago and started presenting to a group soon after I've talked to, to a few groups. Um, and the first that I talked to was a presentation for eighth graders um, in New York uh, over, over Zoom as everything is. Um, and doing a presentation over Zoom, tough to, as it is right now, tough to gauge reaction, tough to gauge response. Um, but I was surprised at the end of that presentation um, in, in the chat, uh, the chat was blowing up. Um, there were questions uh, from a lot of the students um, that you know demonstrated they were really engaged during their presentation and curious about it. Um, and a couple of them were asking if they could see more more of the video, uh, which kind of surprised me. And so I shared the link to the full ninety minute testimony, which is online with the teacher after. Uh, and he let me know the next day that several students came in the next day having watched the full video and like talk to their parents about it, um, which was just beyond anything that that I could have expected. Um, I think video, the video just works really well um, with, with student audiences. Um, and uh, uh, there, you know, there are a couple of questions that I'll ask the, the students. There's the one that you saw in this part of the presentation about um, the, the snow. And then also at the start, I just like to, um, at the beginning, ask if someone can explain what Auschwitz, what they know about Auschwitz, because um, uh, they're usually studying uh, the Holocaust and um, I get some volunteers to, to share that as well. Uh, and the questions that I get at the end are always really interesting. Um, I've spoken to anywhere from middle school to, to college groups um, and, you know, get questions about if he tried to escape um, at any point from any of the camps he was in, uh, got questions about, you know, what was he okay later in life, um, given the extreme trauma that he went through? Um, you know, when did he start, start sharing his story? Uh, uh, and what my experience has been like sharing his story as well. So the, the questions are always uh, my, my favorite part of, of the presentation. Uh, and usually, I mean, I, I like to leave it uh, open to the students to kind of guide the conversation afterward based on what they want to discuss. Um, I'm happy when there are lulls to throw in um, some questions myself and kind of, you know, ask them what they thought was surprising, what they learned. Um, and uh, yeah, that the conversation after is always the best part. So um, thanks for, for listening. Um, and uh, I will hand it off to Heather. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, you know, what a beautiful gift for you to be able to collaborate with your grandfather in this manner and to bring him to life in this way. One of the comments that I wrote was, it's just as much our stories as it is their stories. And I think that that is definitely a big trend and a thread that we see amongst all of our presentations this evening. Um, Dave, you also mentioned that your grandmother doesn't have any childhood photos of herself, 
And it's interesting because my mom doesn't even know what her maternal grandparents look like. And so um, one of the aspects of her identity as a second generation that I've been really attuned to has been the way in which she acts as a grandmother, knowing that she didn't grow up with any grandparents. And she continually says, well, we're making memories, we're making memories. And uh, though it's a little personal to look at from an analytical standpoint, I think it's really interesting to see the impact that it has not only on us, but also on our parents as second generation Holocaust survivors. And as I'll speak to at the end of the presentation, it's interesting to see the way in which this will be transcended down to our children one day. I'm going to just share my screen. Just recently, I unearthed a small folded square of loose leaf paper, which had been neatly cut at the bottom two lines down from where the last entry was made. The profound creases divided it evenly into three columns upon opening, revealing my bubby's handwritten Yiddish running across them. I could not decipher a word, a dead end that begins with me. My mother struggled with the page for a different reason. She sent its translation back to me in a PDF file entitled Names of Family Members. It was handwritten in her meticulous, immaculate, all caps calligraphy on identical blue lined loose leaf paper. This sheet wasn't cut though. She chose to write vertically as if the text had the potential to grow off the page. This is what it said. These are the names of Moisha's family. Mayor, son of David, father. Hana, daughter of Ashel Anshal, mother. Mordechai, son of Mayor, brother. Beryl, son of Mayor, brother. Lima Rivka, daughter of Mayor, sister. Razel, daughter of Yaakov, wife. Yaakov, son of Asher Anshal, uncle. Noha, daughter of Avraham. Gittel, daughter of Yaakov. And then adjacent to those names without a heading, Mindel, daughter of Mayer, my dear mother's name. Ariah David, son of Yechaskel Yosef, brother. Malka, daughter of Yechaskel Yosef, sister. Fagel, daughter of Yechaskel Yosef, sister. Khan, Fagel, Khana Devora, daughter of Yechaskel Yosef, sister. She died in the ghetto. I repeat it aloud as gingerly as its cradle parentheses. She died in the ghetto. Then I utter her name, Hana Devora. My name. I surrender to the haunting silences that reverberate within me. They velocate my skin as sorrow and uncertainty settles in my chest. How could it be? How could it never be known that I inherited my Bubby's dead sister's name? How could this detail be omitted when she cradled me in her arms, held me to her chest, gave me my first bath? What else have I been bequeathed without knowing? What else is hidden in this list of faceless names? Can dead ends be resurrected to form new beginnings? This is a small excerpt from a longer piece on which I've been working as I literally and figuratively unpack my inheritance as a descendant of the Holocaust. In the face of, in the face of an imminent world void of direct survivors, increased attention within academic and global communities has been paid to our group, upon whose shoulders rests the responsibility, sometimes burden, sometimes honorable duty, to carry on our inherited legacies. Many, like Daniel, have their grandparents' oral and written testimonies to bring back to life their voices. For others, like myself, that piece is missing. An exploration of recent memoirs written by members of the third generation reveals the recurrence of objects as the tangible vehicles from which their stories past and present begin. 
Thus, I propose that there is a quest inherent within this expanding body of third generation narratives and my personal piece of creative nonfiction based on my Zadie Satchel that has been bequeathed to me is inspired by this trend. Generally speaking, grandchildren of the Holocaust share insatiable yearnings and obligations to concretize the unknown, catalyzing journeys both of ancestral and self-discovery. During what we plan to be an in-person expansive workshop in the spring, I envision a lively discourse amongst us as we identify the themes within and significance of the third generation and its narratives as we look towards the future of Holocaust memory. In addition to this aim, there are some other goals at the core of which is one of our chief responsibilities as Holocaust educators, which is to humanize and personalize its history and not reduce it to statistics. Upcoming are some essential questions that can guide the workshop and could put in conversation the invaluable importance of testimonies like Daniel's and also explore the expansive potential of using artifacts in the classroom, which is a form of literacy that is sensory, interactive, engaging, imaginative, and authentic. Here are some of the essential questions. How and why do we read primary sources and how can they create a dynamic connection for students to humanize history, enhance their literacy skills and prompt authentic writing? How does artifactual inquiry help us learn, understand and teach? And there was actually an entire uh, issue of the English Journal dedicated to the topic. And more generally speaking, how do objects tell stories? So as I look towards the spring and the workshop that I look forward to us experiencing together, one activity has two potentials inspired by the great work of pedagogue Bonnie Sunstein. We can connect with each other and conduct an artifact exchange, which I did not only at Drew Writing Project this past summer as a participant, but also with my students at the onset of the school year. Both experiences were fantastic and inspired a lot of writing, a lot of introspection, a lot of connection, a lot of observations. Or we can use intimate objects of meaning and have time to dive into our own personal narratives, inspired by the guidance of 3GNY and the evocative nature of Daniel's testimony, the full, full version of which I look forward to hearing in the spring. Admittedly, the procrastinator in me sees four months as four years from now, so I haven't fully conceptualized how the day can unfold meaningfully in person in personal and professional ways. Plus, I would welcome the opportunity to seek your feedback prior to its full formation. But as a whole, as we look towards the spring, my goal is to unpack how we can activate objects and utilize testimony such as Daniel's to increase empathy and highlight the inherent value of primary sources, thus deepening ours and our students' understanding of the Holocaust and of ourselves. I see our artifacts as agents of memory, as bearers of witness, as testimony, and as vehicles to spark narratives. And I look forward to having the workshop together where we can not only consider the ways in which testimony is used, but also how objects harness so many of those memories and become the catalyst for the testimonies that become so personal to ourselves and to each other. Um, yes, I am a third generation Holocaust survivor. I'm a very proud Holocaust educator. And when I was thinking about what I wanted to share with you this evening as we brought the program to a close, I couldn't help but think about a lot of my students. And every year um, I tell them not only that the Holocaust asks more questions than it answers, but also that if they're still lucky enough to have grandparents alive, great aunts, great uncles, then they should take the time this year to tell their stories. And so throughout the year, I try to offer as many opportunities as possible and to encourage students to record their parents and their grandparents' stories, to get it down while they still have the opportunity to do so. My grandparents passed away before I was able to really ask them any questions. And so when I look at the young adults sitting in front of me, 
I so want them to be able to capture this legacy so that they could pass it down from generation to generation, whether or not they're descendants of the Holocaust. We all have stories to tell. And that's one of the reasons why I think artifacts are a great way to humanize and unite us. So over the past several years, I've been absolutely blown away by some of the work that some students have done. Several years ago, Jamie, whose grandparents, whose great-grandparents were survivors of the Holocaust, decided to digitize all of the recordings that her father had done years ago. And she organized everything by theme. I have Leah who has now full albums online of all pictures dating back as far as possible, scanning artifacts, uh, documentation, trying to translate what she can. I have Rebecca, whose grandmother unfortunately passed away two weeks ago, who was able to take pictures of her and write her letters last year, trying to explain to her what it meant to learn her story when she was sitting next to her, even though her grandmother wasn't aware that she was sitting right there. And so when I think about these stories, I thought that it would be most powerful for me to end with one in the celebration of testimony and of what we're doing here this evening. Here's an excerpt from Alexa's from last year. On many Sunday afternoons, my family and I would visit my great grandmother who I called Bubby in her one bedroom apartment in Forest Hills. It was the same every time. We would arrive, sit with her on her bed, eat dinner and leave. Little did I know throughout those few years, I was sitting next to a woman who went through something I could never even begin to imagine. Someone who lost her mother and father to gas chambers at 19. Someone who watched her brother die right before her eyes at the hands of the Nazis. Someone who never thought she would survive. Yet there she was 60 years later, spending time with her daughter, granddaughter, grandson, and five great-grandchildren. If I could go back in time to when I was just five, six, or seven years old, and truly understand the significance of sitting next to this most strong, courageous, and inspiring woman, I would without hesitation. I've always regretted not being in the moment with her and not fully understanding who I was sitting next to. The power that an experience like that holds is immense. But I was simply too young. It's not my fault. However, that does not mean the guilt will simply go away. Thus, after watching Bubby's testimony, I've now taken it upon myself to share her story in hopes that my children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and future generations will never forget the experiences of their influential ancestors. She goes through an eight-page document where she tells her entire grandparents' story, her great-grandmother's story, that she learned about last year for the first time, sitting with her mom, and watching the recorded testimony on the USC Shoah Foundation's website for the first time. She ends her essay. Can't read the top line actually. So I can't see it on the screen, I'll start here. Maybe read the first line to yourself if you can see it. She says, quote, when I die, I want you to remember my grandchildren and great-grandchildren, I left them a little message. Her little message was the interview I was finally able to watch over the last several weeks. Bubby passed away just six months after the interview was conducted. So to Bubby, I promise to always remember, I promise to show my children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren your testimony. I promise to continue to teach myself and others around me the lessons I've learned from hearing your story. I promise never to forget. So as you can see, I get very emotional and there are a lot of times when I get really emotional in the classroom as well. Um, I think that teaching this topic begs us to be vulnerable and to be human. And um, you know, when I have the privilege to experience my students learning so much about their legacies together, um, I think that's what it's all about. And, you know, listening to Dave's story today, listening to Daniel's story today, um, you know, you bring up words like connection and legacy and empathy and understanding. And this to me is at the core of what Holocaust education is. And so when we get together again on May 17th, um, I want that time to be one where we can celebrate our own stories 
Think about the ways in which we can activate testimonies and objects in the classroom in order to offer our students sensory experiences. Um, and also to think about how we can tell our own stories regardless of our backgrounds and also encourage our students to tell theirs. So I look forward to that experience together. And I want to, again, thank you all for being here this evening. And I'm just so honored to be a part of this panel. How do I stop sharing? There we go. Well, any, you know, this was uh, a, a remarkable uh, set of presentations. And it, in my mind, uh, there, is, there are quite a few uh, questions that are raised. And if I could just start uh, by asking um, about the uh, impact in, in the classroom. Um, Daniel, you've, you mentioned the engagement that you had with students. Uh, and I, uh, if, if I heard you correctly, uh, till now you're, you presented only over Zoom. Correct. So what, what kind of um, questions did you get from students? It's a, it's a pretty wide range. Um... I've gotten questions uh, like, um, I forget exactly what was posed, but what did it feel like to learn about your family's history in school? Um, to learn about like events that, that your, your family actually experienced. Um, I've gotten questions about, uh, you know, some were just about his story. Um, I've gotten lots of questions about um, you know, his family members and what happened. I, I talk about some of his family members in the story, but um, sometimes they want to know more about them um, or the, the friends of his that I mentioned in the story. They're interested in, in um, their experiences as well. Uh, and, um, you know, I do also get questions about what, what he experienced, how, how he felt later in life, um, what, what trauma he may have had. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty wide range. Uh, Heather, uh, what kind of uh, questions do you get in the classroom? Yeah, I mean, we definitely get the gamut. Um, you know, I've, I've had the pleasure and the privilege of bringing in Holocaust survivors, second generation Holocaust survivors, and I haven't brought in any third other than me sharing parts of my story with my students later on in the year, but Daniel, I'd be so honored to have you come into the classroom this year as well. Um, they are definitely really interested in all facets of a person's identity. Um, you know, our kids are really sensory learners, they're visual learners. And so as a result, um, they get very interested every time they're able to quote, put a face to the name. In fact, just yesterday, we were looking at an artifact and um, at first I kind of identified it as nameless, but then after we spent some time trying to create our own stories, we actually gave it an identity because this is one object that actually does have a story behind it. And as we know, there are so many anonymous objects when it comes to the Holocaust. And some of the comments that students said afterwards were, it's easier to connect. Uh, it has an identity, it has a face, it's not a ghost anymore. It makes history feel real. Quote, it kind of changes how you look at what happened. It makes it more personal, almost like you know the person who went through it. And one student said, it makes me emotionally invested in it. And so I think that, again, um, whether it's asking questions about um, the experiences that a third generation member feels. I mean, I saw even before, Dave, when you were presenting that note from a student who said, how did you feel when you learned about your grandparents' story? Um, that really resonated with me. And even looking at the photos that you selected, you know, I mean, not for nothing. I think that the third generation, the subsequent fourth generation, we have the power to connect today's youth 
So I think it's that much more important when it comes to Holocaust education, because they're not watching or listening to somebody who seems so much older than them, they could connect with us. And as a result, I think the story becomes all that more personal and able to, and, and connectable. How about you, Dave? What, what have you encountered in your travels through the classrooms? Yeah, uh, very similar in some ways to what Daniel and Heather have shared. Um, that There was one particular presentation that always stands out for me because it was in a, a classroom in an urban setting um, in a school that has a very high immigrant and refugee population. And after my presentation, there was one girl who just her hand kept shooting up, asking detailed question after detailed question. And I could tell that she was working towards something. And finally, she got to where she wanted to go. And she asked, are you aware? She asked me, am I aware? Are you aware that there are things like this happening in other places of the world right now? And based on her dress and her accent and then are confirmed later with her teacher, she was a student who recently moved to New York from a part of Eastern Africa where her family and her I, people of her identity were experiencing, um, I don't know if it was genocide, but certainly vast persecution and violence and war um, based on who they were. And she was making that connection based on the story that I told of my family. And she was making that connection that this is important because it's something that I know too. Um, and that uh, made the hair stand on the back of my neck when I heard that question that she finally got out. That, that was something that I uh, imagined would happen also based on some of my experiences uh, at the uh, college level. And I know Heather, you've mentioned uh, that your uh, students uh, connect and want to tell this, the stories of their uh, families as a result of hearing uh, what you've, uh, what you present. Is that, uh, maybe you want to tell us a little bit about that? Their stories are so diverse. Um, and again, you don't need to be a, a descendant of the Holocaust or have, even have trauma in your background in order to uh, tell a creative story. And uh, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's been really interesting. And some of my students this year have very diverse backgrounds. And so it's a sparked a lot of really powerful conversations in the classroom. And again, I mean, I, you just look at that one student's work from last year, that was her final project. And uh, it just, I think Holocaust education has the potential to so far surpass um, the walls of the classroom and one year of an English class or as an elective. And that's really what my goal is. It leaves an indelible mark. And I hope that my goal is that it leaves an indelible mark, not only academically, but also personally. I mean, what she did last year, she hopes to carry on for generation to generation. And we've all mentioned Lador Vador and it's, it's what we're doing here. Well, that's a, a fantastic note actually to end on. Uh, Michael, yeah, I'm going well, to interrupt you. I'm sorry, if you're going to end, I have to say one more thing. That's um, all right. So perhaps, I don't know how many people in the audience know, Michael is retiring this month, <laughs> um, which I, we all want to wish you a heartfelt congratulations. Um, you know, your impact on the center clearly over a very successful career has been um, just so impressive. And uh, I've been so grateful to have the opportunity to get to know you and to present at some of these conferences over the past few years. And um, just want to wish you all the best. I just want to let you know that we've made donations both at 3GNY and at the Gross Center for Holocaust, Holocaust and Genocide Studies in your honor. And certainly your legacy will live on for, for many, many years there. And uh, we just wanna thank you so much and give you a heartfelt congratulations. Thank you very much. Very, very much appreciated. And uh, my days are numbered. <laughs>
<laughs> in this uh, uh, capacity, but uh, my interest in the field will uh, will remain, I'm sure. And I look forward to uh, being a uh, uh, in the audience uh, in in May. So um, I want to really thank uh, all three of you, uh, Dave Reckus, Heather Lutz, and uh, Daniel uh, Riff, <laughs> uh, to whom I'm uh, related. Um, and uh, to all of you who uh, came this evening. And uh, as stated previously, uh, a recording of uh, this evening uh, will be available on the uh, Ramapo, uh, on the Growth Center uh, page of the Ramapo uh, website and also on uh, 3GNY, right, Dave? Yeah. So uh, thank you very much and uh, see you again. <laughs> <laughs>